Why don't you guys turn with me to Matthew 5. Um, <clears throat> I had plans to finish the Lord's Prayer today, to work uh, through the rest of the Lord's Prayer, and then I started to actually prepare, and I was like, uh, I can't, this is not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Okay, so we'll see how far we get this morning, uh, working through the Lord's Prayer, but this is just such an important topic. It's just been impressed on me, uh, and maybe you've been sensing an experience, a similar thing. Uh, the more I've been studying the Word, Prayer just seems to be jumping off the page is something that's absolutely vital and central to the Christian life, right? What we're studying in the Sermon on the Mount is the Christian life, hence the poster behind me, right? We're thinking through what does Jesus say it means to be a Christian, right? And part of that are the spiritual disciplines. Part of being a Christian are, is things like reading your Bible and giving to the needy and fasting and loving the Lord and devoting yourself to prayer, right? And that's the section of the Sermon on the Mount that we're on. And uh, remember, most of Christian history, guys, people didn't have their own Bibles that they could just go home and read. Right? That's like a very, like in the grand scheme of history, that's a pretty recent thing since the printing press, right? About 500 years or so. Maybe that's wrong. Some of you guys are smarter than me. Something like that. Give or take a few hundred years, right? <laughs> uh, but, but reading our Bible, it's a fairly, excuse me, recent thing, right? What would people do, you know, for at least the very first thousand years of Christianity? How did people grow to know God and love God, right? Well, I think as we study the New Testament, we see they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, right? And so some people did have the scriptures. The scriptures have been with us since day one, but not everyone had a copy of the scriptures since day one, right? Uh, And and by day one, I don't mean literally since Jesus was born. We can talk about that another time. But uh, not everybody's had a copy. What did they do? Well, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. They devoted themselves to gathering together. And one of the things that you'll read again and again and again in Paul's epistles is he's exhorting them to devote themselves to prayer, right? Students, we just read that in Campus Fellowship this last Thursday, right? He says, uh, pray continuously with watchfulness, giving thanks, right? Uh, It's something that uh, was just central to the Christian life, even, dare I say it, more central than studying the Word. For most of Christian history, uh, your prayer life has been kind of one of the pillars of Christian discipline. We would be people that devote ourselves to prayer, Which means, I think, uh, we need to be the kind of people that learn to devote ourselves to prayer, right? Uh, Why don't you, before we read Matthew, let's just get in our minds a sense for the importance of prayer. Let's just prepare ourselves before we jump into thinking through how do we pray well and what does this mean. Let's just elevate as much as we can, like, okay, no, this is something I really want to grow in. Okay, let's just elevate the sense of I really want to learn how to pray. And I think Acts 2.42 can do that for us. So go with me to Acts 2, 42. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but we have a model image of a Christian community here in Acts 2, 42. I promise we're going to get to the Lord's Prayer. Let's just elevate the importance of it here a little bit. I think there's a host of scriptures I could have turned to, but let's just look at this one. In 42, it says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Okay, and that's a summary of uh, everything he's saying. That's a summary of what the community looks like. They were devoting themselves to it. It gives this idea, it connotates this idea that it's something that uh, is taking up a lot of their time and their attention. If you devote yourself to somebody, right? A young mom, when they first have their baby, they have to devote themselves to that baby, right? That baby cries, they're there, right? They just, that baby is going to not live if they don't devote themselves to it, right? They devote themselves to caring for and loving that baby. And this says that the apostles devoted themselves. And one of the things they devoted themselves to was the prayers. And so this phrase, the prayers, it's significant because it doesn't, it it actually implies that there were some kind of scripted prayers. uh, I think absolutely to go along with just praying and sharing your heart with God. We have many examples of that in the scriptures. But when he says the prayers, that that gives us the idea that there were actually some scripted, set, already typed up prayers that they were devoting themselves to. There's nothing wrong with praying a prayer that's scripted as long as you're praying it with all of your mind and with all of your soul. Right? If it's just a pre thing that you just say to say it and you're thinking about worlds of fun or something random, you know, why, it, of course that's worthless. Right? But if it's a prayer that's pre scripted and you're praying it meditatively, you're praying it with your spirit, with your mind, with your heart, and using it as a tool to bring you to the Father, there's nothing wrong with that. That's actually really traditional to historic Christianity. That's not something that only the Catholics do and the Protestants don't do. Okay? Those of you that are raised in the Catholic Church. And almost certainly, 
almost certainly one of the prayers that they would have devoted themselves to would have been the Lord's Prayer. It's, in fact, it's the only one that we can say almost certainly that they devoted themselves to that, right? It's so famous, so popular that it's recorded uh, in the Gospels for us, word for word. Um, and so the apostles devoted themselves to prayer, right? The, the followers devoted themselves probably even to the Lord's Prayer. And then what was the result? Go down to 47. Uh, we'll start in 46, sorry. Go down to 46, and it says, And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. This is a healthy community. They're glad. They're, they're generous. They're ready to share and give. They're not suffering from um, all sorts of ailments. They are happy to be with one another and to be with the Lord, right? Praising God and having favor with all the people. And what's the result? And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. As if we want to be the kind of community that God uses, right? We don't just gather here as a holy huddle to meet our needs and then leave. We want to be the kind of people that are involved in what Jesus is doing through the church, reaching the world, glorifying his name, what all of history is leading up to. We want to be in the game, so to speak. We've got to be the kind of people that devote ourselves to prayer. This seems like just, the, it just seems, as I study the scripture, hopefully, I think you'll agree with me if you do too, that devoting ourselves to prayer seems to be one of the top priorities of the apostles, and it's what Paul just says again and again and again to his followers, keep praying, pray without ceasing, devote yourselves to prayer, pray this, this is what I'm praying for you. This is the example that we have in all of the godly men of history. I think about Martin Luther, a friend of his says that he would devote two to three hours a day in prayer. And Martin Luther said, I'm too busy not to pray. Or I have too many things going on in my life not to pray. He says, if I don't devote two hours a day to prayer, Satan's won the day. And I have too many things that I need to accomplish not to devote hours a day to prayer. Right? Now listen, I'm not saying that we're all tomorrow going to be devoting hours of our life to prayer. I think this is something that we grow in, right? But look what God did through that guy. Look what God did. What we're tempted to say, well, if, man, if you would have taken those two hours, how many more people could he have shared the gospel with? How many more, much more time in a sermon prep? How much more time to Bible study? What are all the things? Two hours a day his whole life? That's like thousands of hours. And yet, if we're the kind of people that really believe that we can do nothing apart from Jesus, unless we're connected to him, right? If we get that in our bones, I think we'll say, how can we not pray? <laughs> I'm just going to spin my wheels and not get anything done if I don't devote myself to being attached to the Lord and being devoted to Him. And yet, I think you guys will relate to this, oftentimes prayer is just very difficult. Like, I challenged you guys last Sunday to take 30 minutes to an hour just to shut yourself in your room or your closet and just try to pray for 30 minutes to an hour, right? Just give yourself to being with the Lord, right? And if any of you tried that, I'm confident I'm confident that either you remember a time when it wasn't easy for you or it wasn't easy for you. You were distracted and you didn't know what to say and you were like, I don't know what I'm doing in here and you, <laughs> you know, maybe even fell asleep, right? I'm not saying anything that any of those things are you know, sinful or, or not normal, but it's difficult, right? It's difficult. And apparently the apostles themselves sense that. And in Luke chapter 11, they come to our Lord and they say, Lord, would you teach us how to pray? They were just hungry. They were desperate. They saw Jesus pray. They saw him spend all night with his father on a mountaintop. And they saw him come down strengthened, right? They saw him come down and they said, I need to learn to pray. I need to learn to be connected to God. And Jesus gave them the Lord's Prayer in response to that. So if we're going to be the kind of church that learns to pray, we've got to be the kind of church that knows the Lord's Prayer, that knows what it's teaching, that devote ourselves to prayer. And guys, the more I've studied this, uh, the more I've just looked at the Lord's Prayer, the more I've become convinced that we should just be the kind of people, like, I, there's nothing for me to add to this. <laughs> In one sense, it's like an incredibly presumptuous place to be up here as a 29-year-old guy being like, I'm going to add on to the greatest prayer ever written by God himself. <laughs> like, what, what could I ever add to this? This is God in the flesh teaching us how to pray. In one sense, we should just read this and we should just say, okay, Lord, and we should just start to pray this. We should start to pray this verbatim, word for word, in our minds, in our soul. Not only that, of course, we have so many examples of Paul and Jesus on the mountain, right? Not only praying this Lord's Prayer, but we should begin to meditate and think and pray. And so that's my hope this morning. I don't presume that I'm going to be able to add anything to this. In one sense, this is perfect. And if I try to add something, all I'm going to do is take away from it. You know what I'm saying? All I'm going to do is tarnish it. In one sense, this is already perfect. And what my prayer has been is that God would just open this up to us. 
Open it up so we could see, okay, why is this so amazing? What is so awesome about this prayer? What would happen to us if we were the kind of people that actually devoted ourselves to praying this prayer? Okay, what would, what would happen to us? And so what are the implications of praying this prayer? We're going to look at, uh, I just first want to point our attention to, if you're looking, you can go back to Matthew if you're still in Acts, Matthew chapter 6. I want to point our attention just to the overall pattern and structure of this prayer, right? He starts off with just worship. This is what we covered last week. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. What does this mean? What, what does this mean? This means that when we approach God, because of the merits of Jesus, we approach God knowing that he's our Father. We, this is not true for the whole world, right? The unbelievers, guys, when they approach God in prayer, they cannot pray rightly, our Father who is in heaven. They can't do that. How do I know that? First John 3, it says, how great the love that God has lavished on us. It's talking about the church, that we would be called the children of God. And in another very real sense, when you become a Christian, you are adopted into the family, indicating that previously you were outside of the family, right? And so in one sense, when you come before the Father and you say, our Father, even in just those words, right? You're, you're doing two things. You're saying, our Father, you're recognizing that this is a family, that you've been saved into something. This isn't some lone ranger race, but you are uh, going to know God by being a part of a community and praying community, uh, communally. And then you're saying, he's your Father, he is your father, and, you, and you're just asking God to, you're just recalling to mind, I should say, you're recalling to mind your state as a son or a daughter of the most holy God. And that is just a wonderful place to be, that you're his child, and that you have his ear. When you pray, you have God's ear because of what Jesus did on the cross, right? You don't have to wonder, is he listening? Is he, uh, okay, what's he feel about me? Like when we pray here, God looks in. Um, I, th th this should produce something. This should actually produce kind of a fear of God. And, and this fear of God, this is an idea that's difficult to understand, but I think one example of this, I, I was talking to Joey about this recently. I think Abraham, when he's praying, he's standing before Sodom. If you guys remember the story, if you don't, I'll tell the story. And, and God is there next to him in some way, whether it's an angel or it's God, right? But he's talking to God in a sense, and he's talking to God, uh, to God about Sodom. On behalf of Sodom, he's saying, okay, Lord, uh, if there's 50 righteous people there, are you going to destroy this place? And God says, not if there's 50, right? I won't destroy it. And then he says, okay, permit me, Lord, your servant, permit me to speak again, right? There's this almost trembling, okay, I'm going to try again, I'm going to speak. Okay, what if there's 30? And there's this trembling nature in his prayer. Do you have you noticed that? And then he keeps going down and he says, okay, God, I can't believe I'm going to ask this. I can't believe I'm talking to you again. And then I'm asking, what if there's even, you know, five people there? There's this sense that he's walking on holy ground, right? And, and I think the best way to understand this, I don't think Abraham is afraid he's going to be destroyed. I don't think he's afraid, right? Like 1 John also says that perfect love casts out fear because fear has to do with judgment. We're not afraid that God is going to judge us because we are in Christ. That's not the fear. What kind of a fear is it? I think the best way that I've understood it and the best way I've heard it explained is it's the kind of fear that you would have if you were in the presence of somebody that you just absolutely revere. You're walking down the street. I don't know who you guys revere today. I don't know who the American Idol is, you know, but you're walking down the street and it's somebody that you're just like, is that who I think it is? You know, maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's Obama. I don't know. Who <laughs> maybe that's a bad example. <laughs> Whoever it is, right? But it's somebody that you're just, I can't believe that's who this is. And then you walk up to that person and are you just going to launch into, hey, how's it going? My name is, you know, you're going to say, I can't believe I'm, you know, you're, you're going to be careful with, I don't want to put my foot in my mouth. I don't even know what I'm going to say. I don't want to, I don't want to make myself sound like an idiot. You know, I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to tarnish this relationship that I can't believe I have with this person. Does that, I think that gets closer at this idea of fear of the Lord. Or if somebody walks up to you and they hand you like this precious, ancient, thousand and thousand year old vase that's worth like $50 million dollars. You're not afraid that the vase is going to destroy you. You're afraid that you're going to destroy it. You know, you're like, oh my goodness, what am I holding right now? That's, that's the kind of sense that we will have when we grasp that we are entering the presence of God in our prayers. The very God that all the angels say, holy, 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 hallowed is his name. We come before this God and we say, oh, you are God, hallowed be your name. There's a sense of reverence and awe, and yet... In another sense, he's our father. 
and he's our dad and we can run up to him and we can give him a hug and we can share whatever is on our hearts. We can empty ourselves. We can know him and love him and be fully assured that this God has our good will in mind. He who gave us his only son, how will he not also give us all things? We know this, that God works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes, right? So it's this dual relationship. When we approach God in prayer of his reverence and holiness along with this familiarity that he is God and we enter by Jesus' blood and we learn to pray that way when we understand we've been washed by Jesus. This is the first part of our prayers. This is what Jesus says. And then secondly, what we say is, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And guys, every single commentator that I've read, every single person that is smarter than me, that's more spiritual than me, that loves the Lord more than me, whether they're old or young, every single person here says, listen, the order matters. And we intuitively know this, right? Like your spouse or your friend comes home from a long trip and the first thing that you say to them is, hey, can you uh, get me that food out of the fridge, please? I'm really hungry. That's not going to go well for you, all right? Just marriage tip. If you're not married, that's not how you do that, okay? If your spouse comes home, the first thing you say is, hi, hello, how are you? Let me give you a hug, right? Let's talk for a little while, okay? Let's see how you're doing. And then it's acceptable then to say something like, hey, can you go get me that? That's over there on the counter, right? The order is really significant here. What Jesus is saying, what Jesus is saying here is, is that we should be the kind of people that long for his kingdom to become, to come. We long for his will to be done even more than everything that comes after that. What comes after that even more than our daily bread? Even more than us uh, wanting to be forgiven ourselves, right? And even more than we're concerned with forgiving others. Even more than being not led in temptation, but being kept in the faith, our own spiritual well-being. More than all those things, the first desire and longing of the Christian heart is that we would pray, Oh God, your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus doesn't tell us to pray these things and not feel them. He doesn't tell us to pray these things like hypocrites that say that, you know, say we're close to him when our hearts are far from him. The reason Jesus tells us to say these things and pray these things, guys, it's because Jesus wants us to feel these things. Does that make sense? Are you guys with me? Are you with me? Does that make sense? We're working through what are the implications here? What are the implications of the Lord's Prayer? One of the implications when we pray this, like literally, like when we go and just pray this prayer, one of the things that has to happen if we're not going to be hypocrites is we soften our hearts to long for God's kingdom to come and long for his will to be done instead of just our own. How often do we just rush into prayer? I'm so guilty of this. And we just list our needs. Right? Lord, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this. Right? And Jesus is saying, don't do that. You know, don't, and there's nothing wrong with supplication. This, the Lord's Prayer is mostly supplication. And there's nothing wrong about praying for your needs. Right? He says, pray for your daily bread. There's nothing wrong with that. You're not sinning. But what do you desire most? That's a question that's worth meditation. What do I desire most? Augustine, when he was teaching on this, in just a kind of a classic way, the way he thought of discipleship and Christian formation, he thought of as rightly ordering your loves. That you wouldn't love anything that you shouldn't love inordinately, right? Like if you love Marvel, you wouldn't love Marvel movies more than you love, you know, things that you should love your neighbor, (laughs) more than you love this, that, that, you, that you would have rightly ordered loves. He says, that's the mark of a mature Christian. And what should be at the top of our loves, what all of Scripture proclaims, is we should love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and our neighbor as ourselves. Those are our top two loves, and everything else should come after that. And how you'll know, right? Okay, so you might be sitting here thinking, okay, how do I know? <laughs> Okay, do I love God like that? Do I desire his kingdom to come? Is this my desire? What you can do is be, think, back, think about your prayer life. What do you pray for the most? If you have a journal, go back and read your prayer journal. What are you writing for the most? What are you praying for first? What's the first thing off your lips? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? What is that? That will reveal to you what you long for. And what Jesus is saying here is long for his kingdom to come. Does that make sense? And listen, if you're feeling conviction this morning, let me just encourage you. Guys, this is a battle that I promise you I'm fighting and the person next to you is fighting. Like we live in the wealthiest, most comfortable, one of the greatest nations in the world. And I love living here. Praise God that we live here, right? 
But the inertia, the the temptation in every ministry that I've ever been a part of is always going to be to drive us to care more about our comforts and care more about what we're doing, care more about our life and care less about the kingdom. That's going to be the pressure that's on you every day. Every commercial you watch, every radio station you listen to, that's going to be the drive in general. That's where we tend to be pushed by our culture and we have to fight. We have to fight to remember I'm eternally minded. There's a kingdom that's coming. I'm not just, insert your occupation here, I'm a son or daughter of God. I've been given a mission. This is what I'm doing. You have to fight to maintain that. You're not a bad, you're not abnormal. You're not a bad Christian necessarily if this is where you're at. We're all fighting this battle together. Fighting to maintain this kingdom mindset, fighting to maintain an evangelistic out mindset, right? Fighting to be missional, fighting to long for his kingdom to come. And if you know somebody like that, if you know somebody in this room that you feel like, I feel like that person really does long for God's kingdom to come, longs for God's will to be done more than their own, just be around that person. <laughs> just follow that person, imitate that person, get with that person, right? Make that the culture of your life. Imitate that person. But uh, if we're really going to pray this, I think it's worth some time asking, what in the heck does this mean <laughs> to pray your kingdom come, right? Like when I pray that, okay, I'll pray those words, but if you have no idea what it means, you're just going to pray the words and you're not going to think about it in your heart. You're not going to feel it. So it is worth some time thinking through what does Jesus mean by praying your kingdom come. The the best uh, um, definition for kingdom that I found, and I think we could see this in the Old Testament. I don't have enough time to show you this morning. If you took the Old Testament class, hopefully you're going to ha- remember some things. Is God's kingdom, is God's people, which is the story of creation where he saves some people for himself from Abraham in God's place, which we can see when he leads them into the promised land, doing God's will which is represented by the Mosaic Covenant when they receive the law. And all of these things converge in Jesus. All of these things converge in the church. All of these things converge in what we're doing now, right? So uh, God's people, uh, when God's kingdom comes, it means it comes and people are saved, right? Think about John chapter 3. Think about what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. He's saying, unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. How does the kingdom come? It comes when people believe the gospel. It comes when people enter into the kingdom. It comes into another soul. It enters into another person. The kingdom spreads its boundaries a little bit more when one person gets saved, right? And so in one sense, when we're praying, God, your kingdom come, what we're praying for, what we're longing for is, God, would you save souls? Would you bring your kingdom into Manhattan by saving many people in this place until it's a saturated community with your gospel, right? until it's saturated here, until this place is different because your kingdom comes. Probably my favorite preacher, you know, I've I've got like kind of a weird crush on him, is Martin Lloyd-Jones. He's this old dead guy. And he preached at this place called Aberavon. And it was this old mining community that was like pretty destitute. And people were very impoverished. It was in the, it was in the Welsh community. And the, a lot of the guys had a huge problem with alcohol. And so they'd go make this money. And before they could bring it home to their wives to feed their kids who were starving, they'd go spend it in the, in the bars to get drunk, right? The alcoholism was just rampant in this place. And so the bars were just one of the, thriving, uh, you know, economies there. They're one of the thriving businesses there. And Martin Lloyd-Jones, he was going to be a super successful surgeon. He was on track to make tons of money, and he felt called to the ministry, and he left it all behind, and he entered in without a whole lot of formal training, and they just gave him this city because it was like, nobody else will take this place. Here, you want to preach? Go preach here. And the first day he went in there, I've shared this story with some of you guys. He was talking to the pastor who he was about to take the pastorate from this guy, and he said, hey, don't preach inside. Nobody will come. You got to go outside and preach. And Martin Joy Lo Joan, like, okay, thank you very much. I'm going to ignore that. And he went in and he canceled all their Christmas services. He canceled all this fluff, all these programs. He just canceled it. And he was like, we're going to have three meetings a week. Three meetings a week. And he just preached and proclaimed the gospel faithfully again and again and again. And over time, people started to come. And something amazing happened. Revival broke out. Something just amazing that if you've ever studied it, sometimes in history, God is pleased just to send his spirit in unique ways. And guys, so many people got saved in that city that the bars closed. Like imagine what would need to happen in Manhattan, Kansas for us to proclaim the gospel so faithfully that enough people get saved that Tubby's is like, we don't have enough business. Shot stop shuts down. Aggieville's all boarded up. 
Oh, Lord, may your kingdom come, right? That would be a glorious, glorious thing to the Christian community. That would be a glorious witness to God's power. If, God, if enough people got saved, that those businesses couldn't survive anymore. Wouldn't that be amazing? In one sense, that's what it means for God's kingdom to come, is people get saved, right? And not only is it that people get saved, but it's that people get saved and then God's will is done. If you think about this idea of a kingdom, there's a king and he has dominion, king dumb, right? And where his dominion is, is where his will is done. Jesus says, uh, I think it's in Luke, um, he says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Right? If you remember that verse. In other words, if Jesus is going to be your Lord, which is, uh, you know, also the same thing as Jesus being your king, which is a part of Jesus' kingdom, if that's going to happen, then you do what he says. And so in a very real sense, you are in the kingdom of God right now. And yet Jesus' kingdom can grow in your own hearts as you learn to obey and submit and release yourself to him as your king and Lord. Right? Right? And so Jesus' kingdom comes as souls are saved. And then as those souls are saved, we learn to follow and obey him as Lord. And his kingdom really does come in our own heart more fully and in our own city more fully as disciples are made. And as we learn to obey him and love him and serve him, in a very real sense, his kingdom comes, right? Going back to our old scenario, we could share the gospel and a lot of people could make professions of faith. But unless they start to obey Jesus, the bars aren't going to shut down, right? Right? Unless they start to say, okay, I'm not going to get drunk anymore. Okay, I'm not going to go out and just look for hookup culture anymore. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to live that way. You know, Jesus is my Lord now. I'm not my Lord. I have to submit to him. Unless we do that, his kingdom will not come. I'll tell this short story quickly to uh, illustrate this just for the sake of time. We were out on Florida's campus uh, sharing the gospel over spring break, and I saw a couple that were sharing this gospel with a very, very animated uh, Florida gator. She was a gal, and they kind of, I was sitting there talking to another person, and I, they were just like giving me eyes. They were kind of like, hey, can you come over here? Like, can you come help me over here? And so I was like, okay, and I kind of like entered into this conversation where two Christians were sharing the gospel with this one girl, and she was just like super intense, like, uh, you know, kind of, kind of, you know, kind of like trying to convince these Christians to stop being Christians and kind of trying to convince them like, hey, listen, Jesus would want you to be happy. You know, what Jesus wants most is for you to be happy and whatever inclinations, whatever desires he's given you, he gave those to you for you to fill out. And so if you have homosexual desires, he gave those to you because he wants you to be healthy and fulfill those. If you have desires to lie, he gave those to you to be, right? If you have desire, whatever your desires are, Jesus gave those to you and he wants you to obey and follow them. That was kind of her line of thinking, right? And so I, I entered into this conversation and I was just chatting with her and she um, just very candidly, you know, confessed some sin. And she said, yeah, I'm a Christian, of course, I love Jesus. And uh, said some of the things that she was doing with her boyfriend and some of the things that she'd done with girlfriends that she used to have, right? And, uh, and we were just talking about it and I said, okay, what if Jesus was here right now and he told you, uh, hey, I want you to stop doing, you know, and I said this specific, stop doing that. What if Jesus himself was here, right? It's not me, it's not these guys, it's just, it's Jesus. And he says to you, hey, I want you to stop that. And she says, you know, she said like, well, what would happen? You know, I would ask him, what would happen if I don't, right? Like, what are you going to do if I don't, right? That was kind of her adversarial mindset. And right there, it's like, okay, <laughs> he's not your Lord, you know. And I said, I, okay, you know, he says you'll go to hell or something like that. I didn't know, I was thinking on the spot. And she was just standing there thinking, she said, I don't know what I would do. And as lovingly and as gently as I could, I said, then Jesus is not your Lord. You're your Lord. And you're not a Christian if Jesus is not your Lord, to some degree, right? And man, she did not like that. <laughs> it, it did not go well after that. But, but actually, it, it was a really good thing. It softened her. She got really angry at me and less angry at those other two guys, and they were able to talk to her a lot more easily. It was a guy and a gal. But do you see what I'm saying here? Like, like, of course, we all wrestle with this idea of lordship. Is Jesus fully Lord? Right? Do I obey him perfectly? We're all growing in this. But is there a sense, right? When Jesus' kingdom really comes, he becomes the center of your life. And if he says jump, you say how high. If Jesus is really your Lord and your king, you are able to pray, okay, God, your will be done. And what's terrifying about that prayer is it's a letting go of all of your idols. If you're really going to pray, your will be done from the heart, you're recognizing that what Jesus is saying is, okay, there's, I have open table here. Whatever I call you to in one sense, you're putting it on the table. 
I, I think the perfect example of this is uh, I have a friend that went to church here. She still goes to church here. And she said there was an idol that she had, which was this church. It was really interesting. She said, you know, I felt like I was praying your will be done, but I felt like I had like something I was hanging on to behind my back that I wasn't putting on the table and it was my attendance here. It was like, would I, you know, am I, am I willing to put that on the table? Am, am I willing to put, you know, I love these people. I love this community. I love the church, but, but has this become an idol to me? And you should be watchful. Like, that's possible. If Jesus calls any of you out of here, like, you should go. He's your Lord, not me, right? And, it, and she's still a part of this church today, but there was something that happened in her soul where she put it on the table. She put it on, okay, Lord, that's not, I'm willing to go. I'm willing. It doesn't mean you have to go. It doesn't mean he's telling you to go. Even it doesn't mean that's what's going on if you're wrestling with that. But is it on the table? Is he the Lord of every area of your life? What is it for you that's behind your back? What is it for you that you're hanging on to? What is it for you that you have trouble? You think, I don't know if I could be happy if, I, if you took that away from me. I don't know if I could exist. Is it a relationship? Is it a certain job or is it income or is it where you go to church? Is it, it, what is it for you? Put it on the table. That's what Jesus is telling you to do when you pray, your will be done. It's a synonym almost to praying your kingdom come. That's why they're, par- that's why they're back, it's the backside of a coin, right? Your kingdom come and your will be done are very, very similar things. And what would happen to us if we were the kind of people that we just prayed this prayer? We longed for his kingdom to come. We longed for souls to be saved. We longed for his kingdom to come and his will to be. And we put all the idols on the table and we just gladly served Jesus, wholly devoted to him. Can you guys imagine if we devoted ourselves to this prayer that way? But then finally, the last step of kingdom is that God's kingdom would come in God's place. And guys, when God gave us the Great Commission in Matthew 28, he said, go therefore into all the world all the world. So where is God's place now? It's no longer Israel. It's no longer that strip. It's no longer that section of the world. No, God expanded his kingdom, his place, the place where he wants to rule to every corner of the world. Every corner of the world, right? Uh, I think there's a scripture that says you've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. And in certain countries, the kingdom of darkness reigns. Right? In certain countries, the kingdom of darkness reigns more than the kingdom of light. I think of India in particular, right? Like there's, it's just filled with Hindus and Muslims. It's just filled with so many people. It's very void of gospel witness. I think Japan as well, right? And guys, in a very real sense, when, when those people, when Hindu that follow that faith, they worship their gods, like I actually think they're worshiping something. I actually think they have interactions with those gods. Like, I actually think something real happens. Why? Because in a very real sense, they're serving demons. That's not a popular thing to preach nowadays. But it's, act- it's true. In a very real sense, they're worshiping something. They're worshiping Satan and his, his, his kingdom, right? They're in the kingdom of darkness. They're enslaved to darkness. And when his kingdom comes, we proclaim the gospel in these places where the gospel witness is dark and they're transferred into the kingdom of light and his kingdom grows across the whole globe. And guys, that's what's been happening from the beginning of the church. You don't need to despair. America might be failing morally. It is. It's failing morally. It might even collapse, right? I don't know. I don't have a, fork for, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't tell what's going to happen, right? But here's what I can tell you. We started off with about 12. And from there, about 700 or 500 that saw it. And from there, about 5,000. And I can tell you this. If you just track the growth of the church, there's downs, but there's always a net gain. His kingdom has been spreading across the globe since the beginning of the new creation, since the beginning of Christ himself, right? Isn't that amazing? It is growing. And when we pray, God, your kingdom come, we're praying that it would come to the farthest reaches of the world, that we would be an outward-facing church, ready to give our resources to missions, ready to give our time to missions, ready to give our prayers to missions, ready to reach our own backyards, and ready to have Jesus' kingdom come in our own hearts. All of those things are things that you're praying. (laughs) Isn't that awesome? Hopefully meditatively. Hopefully you're, you're praying this, thinking about these things. And when you're praying, your will be done, right? These are the things that you are praying. You're praying that Jesus' will will be done. I have, more, uh, I have more to share here. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to share with you guys more to share on this idea of your will be done. Uh, to pray your will be done, the implications of this are ultimately that you lay, not, uh, part of it is that you would lay your, all your idols on the table, right? But what he's saying here is not just that your will will be done in your own heart, right? But he's praying that your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
And I, I, um, if you want to talk about the nuances of, okay, Job says nothing can thwart your will, right? Like uh, your will is always done. No man can thwart your will. And, and yet you're saying here in some very real sense, God, your will is not done on earth. I'd love to talk to you about that. Maybe we can cover it next Sunday. I'll go back and cover that. But uh, in a sense, somehow, some way, God's will is not done on this earth. And as we're proclaiming the gospel and making disciples, they bring their lives in conformity with the will of God. And his will is done in a very real sense. And that in no way negates the fact that nothing can thwart God's will and that he is sovereign. Both those things are compatible. But just one real quick point. Whenever you guys are praying this prayer, whenever you go home and you pray your will be done, I think one really sweet thing that I just wanted to touch on, there's, there's a host of implications here. I'm hitting on a few. As you meditate and pray on this prayer, I think the Holy Spirit will reveal more things to you. But one of the things that I think will reveal to you is I think it will remind us of our frailty and our inability to order our lives well. Like I think what will happen is you're praying, and I know a lot of you, especially college students, but it's not just college students, you've got big decisions in your life to make, right? You've got things that you're trying to figure out. Should I do this? Should I do that? Should I figure this out? Should I do this? Should I go this way? Should I zig? Should I zig? Should I join that guy? Or that, you know, what should I do in my life? We make a hundred decisions every day. Some of them more important. Some of them less important. But when we pray this, your will be done, what we're reminded of is that we lack the wisdom to make all of these decisions perfectly. Right? We lack the wisdom to do it. We just don't know how to do it. And if we fixate on our own inability, if we fixate on the fact that we can't do it, it'll drive you crazy. It'll, anxiety will dominate your life. But if you can just learn to pray this prayer, God, your will be done. There's a kind of surrender, that, there's kind of an acknowledgement and acceptance that I'm not smart enough. I'm not wise enough. I can't make, and I'm going to do the best I can. But at the end of the day, God, I just pray your will be done. And you, in one sense, release that to him, and there's real peace and there's real freedom there while remembering that you are frail and unable to say and do these things, right? And guys, our greatest example of this is Jesus, our Lord himself. Our Lord himself. He, uh, when he was dying, <laughs> when, he was, when he was getting ready to die, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, he himself prayed, Lord, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go, I don't want to die. If there's any other way, Lord, let it be done that way. And yet we have an example of the perfect submission and surrender to the will of the Father and our Lord Jesus. And he said, yet not my will, but yours be done. Isn't that wonderful? Like, like Jesus, in one sense, he reveals and relates to us in our humanness there. He says, I don't want to do it, Lord. And if you've ever actually given up idols, whatever they are, whether they're addictions or whether they're, you know, things that you love or you just can't let go of or you've found your security and your value, if you've ever actually fought that battle, it's an incredibly difficult battle. And I promise you, what you're thinking is, I don't want to do it, Lord. If it's a real, if it's a real, that's what's going on probably. And Jesus, isn't it wonderful? He relates to us and if there's any other way, and yet he shows us the other side as well. And yet, Lord, your will be done. He, he reveals to us what perfect trust in a loving father looks like. And as we pray this again and again and again, I hope, I pray, what happens in our church is we pray your will be done. We get to a point where we trust God as our loving father the way Jesus did. Right? Why was Jesus able to let go of equality with God and come to this world and take on all the pain that he experienced? Why was he able to do that? is because he trusted his father's plan, right? He didn't do a single thing unless Jesus told him. He, he trusted him as a loving father and showed us the way. And as we pray that, whatever circumstances God leads us into, we learn to trust him like a loving father. Because here's what I can promise you is going to happen. Like, I'm very, very confident of this, that you're going to live your life. I don't know how long you're going to live, and it's not going to turn out the way you want it to. It's not going to go exactly how you expect it to go. What Maybe your kids will have birth defects, Maybe your marriage won't go the way you want it to go. Maybe you'll never find that perfect job. Maybe you'll you know, have your own health struggles. Maybe you'll have a son or a daughter, heaven forbid, that walks away from the Lord or dies young. I don't know. But there's a lot of people in this room, and we've got a lot of years of life to live. And here's what I know for sure. Tragedy is unescapable in this world. And, and the really, really good news is that when Jesus came to his apostles, right, he, he didn't tell them, your life is just going to be awesome, right? Right, what did he tell Peter? When John 21, what did he tell him? He showed him that when you were young, you went wherever you want, but when you were old, you will be lifted up. 
And in this way, he showed him, he showed him how he would glorify God. In other words, it was God's will for Peter to suffer. And he hung and died upside down on a cross. And so what we do when we pray this prayer is when we experience hardship, right? Like, I think we think of that hardship as its own special class. But like, if one of us was executed in a prison, I don't think we'd think about it that way anymore. I think it would be on the same level as if a baby died or on the same level as one of these incredibly difficult things happen. We've just mourned the loss of our friends and say, how could God let something like this happen? And yet if we can be the kind of people that pray this continually and we can say to that, your will be done, we can become the kind of people that trust in and are unshakable in our loving father Jesus, right? And our loving father and his son Jesus. Or I think about Saul. When he got saved, guys, what did Jesus say to him? <laughs> Somebody showed me a meme kind of about this the other day, right? Jesus, got, Jesus saved him, and it wasn't your best life now. <laughs> now that you're a Christian, let me show you how you're going to reign in life and rake in the money, and everything's going to be awesome. No, Saul got saved. Those scales fell from his eyes, and the first thing Jesus said to him is, I will show him how much he must suffer for me. In other words, it was God's will that he would suffer and yet Paul embraced that and said, I can't believe I'm counted worthy to suffer for the Lord. He trusted that even in his suffering, God was sovereign and he was trusting the will of the Father. And guys, that's the way we're going to get through suffering as a church when it comes. We're not going to get through it by saying, how could you ever let this happen to me? I can't believe you would do this, right? It's okay to cry out to God. It's okay to voice those things. The Psalms are filled with that, right? Of course, we're going to feel those things, but we get to the point where we trust him again. Where we pray, your will be done. Your will be done. I, I, some people don't like that prayer. Like you're praying for a sick person and you're praying. Yeah, I think we should pray. Pray that that person would be healed. Amen. In faith, hoping Jesus will save and believing Jesus will heal that person. And yet, I just read Jesus' prayer and I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, yet not my will, but your will be done. Because Jesus prayed it. He tells us to pray it. It doesn't mean you lack faith or you're not believing something. It means you're surrendering your own will to the Father's. It's a really healthy thing. It's that some people think that what faith means is not surrendering your will and just hanging on and it has to go this way. And if I admit that it might not go this way, I don't have faith, right? I think what Jesus is saying here is, uh, say, your will be done. Let go of your idols. Trust him as a good father, whatever comes your way. At the bare minimum, the sovereign God allowed that suffering to happen, right? and he's able to work it together for good. Trust him to see it happen, right? The perfect example is Jesus. The perfect example is Jesus. This is the worst crime in all of ever, right? An innocent man killed for something he didn't do, suffering more than we could imagine, separated from God when he never deserved it in one sense, right? And risen again from the dead, and yet he said, I trust you. Your will be done. And when we remember that about Jesus, we can imitate him and we can pray that your will be done. And that's what we're going to celebrate when we take communion here in a second. But what, guys, what would happen to us if we were just the kind of church that prayed these things? And it's okay to pray and say, okay, your kingdom come, and then to riff a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Or to, to you know, say your own thing. Okay, your kingdom come. God, I pray you'd save my neighbor, right? Okay, your will be done. Oh, Lord, I, I'm sorry I've been this way. I just, I, I relinquish this to you or whatever, right? It's okay to riff in the middle of this prayer, but pray it, right? With your heart, pray and long for his kingdom to come. Pray and long for his will to be done. Trust him on earth as it is in heaven. 